about the minimalistic approach to the control of cell growth. So please, but then you have 15 minutes. Okay, thank you. Right, I'm going to use this to get Tom a good recording. <laughs> right, so I'm just going to talk briefly about some minimalistic approach stuff we did last summer. So basically, this was work, if those of you who came last year remember, Duncan, my student who came with me last year, who was a year 12, which means age 17 student, on a, a six-week summer place in Worse. And so the aim of this was to build a really simple bow controller that only controlled the rudder, and to do an extended test of it and see just how far we can make a boat sail with just a simplistic rudder controller. So what we want to do is throw it in the Irish Sea or into Codding Bay or Fabro Swift and see how far it would go and what would happen to it. <coughs> so we used one of our moot boats. I think we've got a few of these around if anyone wants to see one or hasn't seen one before. These are 72 centimetre long fiberglass hulls. They're quite a shallow keel and based on a sort of folk boat design, so the rudder is immediately behind the keel to stop seaweed snagging on the rudder. Um, most of them, up until this one, were based on wing sails. There is a magnetic linkage in the rudder, so there's no hole through the deck for the rudder. The only holes going through are for the sail and for the screws to hold the deck on. They're actually pretty watertight. We've submerged them for a while before, we've thrown them in, we've battered them around a lot, and they've actually done pretty well. But their upwind performance isn't too good because the keel's too wide and they sail best on being rich. They were designed with the transatlantic in mind, but because of this limitation, they're probably just never going to get enough speed to actually do a transatlantic race. And actually, Paul Miller from the US Naval Academy has designed us an improved version called the Maxi Moop, which we also have out in a tent here, which is the, the big yellow hold. So, so hopefully, in a year or so, we'll be seeing one of them sail. So, this is the actual one we used for this work and we replaced the sail with actually the remains of one of our old dinghy sails from Pinter, our transatlantic attempt. And the sail is just fixed to the deck with a piece of string. So it's always on what's roughly a beam reach position. Inside there's a pick microcontroller controlling the rudder and a potentiometer that just adjusts the target heading and then a simple digital compass and a proportional control for the rudder. We'd originally tried to build an analog control system just purely out of electronics, partly as an educational exercise for Duncan, and also because we thought it would be a, a simpler, cheaper way of building a controller. But we never quite managed to get this right, and we, we almost had a circuit that worked, but there seemed to be some under certain conditions it would short circuit and destroy the circuit, so we went for an ultra simple digital system instead. So the plan was to launch about 10 kilometres west of Aberystwyth and sail it straight east back onto a large sandy beach. So we just set the, the compass point for east and I'll show you the launching video. And this is a BBC film crew in the background, but unfortunately they never showed this piece of footage. He was slightly hesitant about launching it this way. So, in order to sort of work out where or what happened to it, we did some calculations based on what happened with the tide and the wind during the course of its journey. So, we recorded um, tidal observations from an Admiralty tidal stream mapper. So, this gives you the direction and speed of the tide at hourly intervals. So, based on this data, we were able to construct a crude tidal model for the bay to try and work out what the um, tidal vector was at any time in the boat. We also took the wind observations from the nearest um, wave point, which is about 30 miles to the south at a place called Alpha Bulf. So I've got a sequence of maps here where yellow arrows are the tide and white arrows show you the wind direction. So this is the day we launched. If my laser pointer works, which it doesn't. The first point is this one here. And it comes around to there. So you see about halfway around the tide actually flips direction, which seems to cause the boat to tack. 
and actually it starts heading by the other way. So this suggests that actually the rudder did not make enough action to keep it on course, or the batteries are gone by that point, but according to our calculations, the battery should last around a week. So in day two, we start seeing the tide and wind actually helping together, and then again, we get attack, probably caused by the tide, and it flips around into some couple of loops. The third day, we seem to now be heading back out to sea. Oh, sorry, looking in the wrong direction. Actually, no, we're heading back towards land, so maybe the, the rudder is helping there, but I can't tell. On the fourth day, we start heading a bit north, and the wind actually starts to pick up, and then there's actually a, the remains of an Atlantic hurricane that came in. And on the final day, it ended up north of the bay, and actually, we get this interesting scenario right at the end, where there's quite a strong wind, I think this is about a 20 knot wind, but there's a weak tidal current coming straight against the boat. Now in the past when we sell these boats, even a weak tidal current was actually enough to stop them moving, because this is about half a knot of tide, yet it actually still makes progress at over one knot towards the beach. And actually there's one data point missing off this map due to the way it's plotted, but it's about here, and we never found it again. Um, I actually went up to the beach to have a look for it. So this is in that cove I was just looking at. Basically, I tried to climb along the rocks, which is not a sandy beach. There's no other way of getting out to the other end. And I couldn't get beyond the point with the first red arrow. So I couldn't see anything obvious. It's quite possible the boat was just hiding between some rocks or that it'd been smashed to pieces, and we don't know. So it would have been very nice to get it back. We did put contact details inside, but no one ever found it. Um, so, so not sure how many conclusions I can actually draw from this, but one is that the tide seems to be causing us to attack, and therefore that maybe not having a sail actuator isn't good enough to keep you going, of course. Um, perhaps if we had a more consistent wind direction or if we'd gone downwind, that might have been easier. Um, or that we discharged the batteries, and the batteries were 13 amp hour size F cells that should have given us a few days worth of operation. Um, the interesting thing though is that we actually saw the loop sail faster than we ever sailed it before, so that actually suggests that maybe this rig design actually works better than the wing sail for getting some speed up. And also, given the sea conditions, they're far worse than anything we sailed in on the lake. So actually, we, we've exceeded previous sort of what we thought was the maximum performance of a move. And we'd also had issues before with Spot Messenger, which we used to track its positionality. So we put this on pin to our transatlantic boat, and we had a report every six hours, and we had about a 50% message failure rate. With this, I think we had a 95% success rate. So this was a lot calmer water, and perhaps slightly better mounted the spot. That suggested in calm water, the spot's fine, but maybe when you take out to the rougher seas of the Atlantic, actually the, the pitching and rolling is too much to maintain a satellite signal. And spots are a one-way simplex transmission system. So if you can't maintain that two-way comms, you have no way of acknowledging your message got through. And that maybe it's not the most reliable systems to be using. Right, any questions? Uh, do you have any question? Yes, please. What's the budget for to build such a boat and for uh, this kind of testing campaign? Um, this boat's um, total build budget was probably about £100 excluding the spot tracker, which is probably another £100 on top of that. And the actual launching was done on the back of another trip we were doing for BBC filming our big boat. So we, we paid nothing extra to the launching that day. So it was done as a very cheap experiment. Colin, what, what was the target course you planned for? So, to go back to that page, the original target was to launch here and wash up here. So it, the, the first hour or so, a couple of hours is good, and then it just completely deviates. Because that seems quite random. Yes. But this is only compass heading control. There's no GPS. Yes, so, I mean, but can, can you call this true navigation? Or just let the boat go with the wind and with the tide? I think it's somewhere halfway between the two. It's, it's certainly not controlled navigation, or else it would be a straight line over here. But it's an attempt to doing it with just the rudder. And I think that's not enough. You need a sail actuator. So statistically, you, you can see that the boat is attracted to the right. Uh, should be. But I haven't actually done that analysis. No, no. Um, I'm not even convinced that would show through. But. And I also have a comment on your, one of your conclusions. 
Uh, third one, it is possible for a good cell against a weak type and so on. Uh, this is not true for anything in the water. I mean, if you put the bottom in the water with a strong wind and a weak type, it will go with the wind. But we exceeded what we previously seen. Though. When we tried to sell against a half an hour current before, with that kind of wind speed, we didn't succeed at all. So in previous sort of testing, we've made no headway against the current of that strength with that wind speed. So, so thank you. Okay. Thank you.